John Romansky, who is a civil servant and the head of development plan delivery for the Minister of Housing, Communities and Local Government. We have Jim Davies, is, who is a geologist turned strategic planner for the Environmental Agency. Uh, Sarah Adams, who is a rural housing enabler working across both the Malvern Hills and the Whitehaven District Council. And we have Virel Desai, who is a principal planner with Atkins Birmingham. So that's everyone so far and thank you for coming. Thanks for inviting me to speak and I'll, I'll try and be brief on this just to run through my career and obviously uh, people can ask questions on on the specific elements but as you can see I currently work for the Ministry of Housing Communities and Local Government formerly known as DCLG but um, this is obviously my most recent uh, um, uh, uh, post and uh, I've, I've worked in a number of fields across planning so I'll just take you through those now so um, next slide please. So as a lot of you, I went to university, Newcastle upon Tyne, if it isn't obvious from, 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 from the slide. Uh, I did a diploma there for three, uh, sorry, an undergrad for three years before doing a diploma for two years, one year of which was uh, working within working within industry. But I got into planning uh, mainly because I was quite good at geography and had a social conscience. So uh, my sixth form tutor at the time just pointed out maybe I'd like to get involved in it. And um, here I am uh, more than 20 years, 20 years later. So uh, next slide, please. So this was my um, year out. I did one year working within a policy team at Warwickshire County Council. Uh, this ages me. I worked on a structure plan, um, which um, is, is, is slightly upsetting because uh, things have moved on since then. But essentially doing the strategic policy for, for the county of Warwickshire, where the uh, uh, subordinate councils would have to do detailed plans. Um, we don't have that system anymore. Obviously, things, things have moved on. But um, yeah, a lot of my time was just spent uh, liaising with other authorities. And actually, I was given the responsibility of dealing with the key diagram in the um, in, 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 in there, but I was only there for a year. It was very difficult for me to really understand if this is what I wanted to do. So uh, next slide. Then uh, when I was studying, I mean, we have a speak from the Environment Agency, so I will not dwell on this, but whilst I was studying, I spent time at the Environment Agency, mainly just uh, responding to consultation responses on, uh, well, doing consultation responses for councils and development management planning applications, uh, and just did that whilst I was studying. So if we go on to the next slide. My first actual job was in a busy development, well again, it ages me, it, back then it was development control, it's now development management, but I was a development control officer. I really enjoyed this work, I think I, I may have struggled with some of the policy side of things, but I, I have a real passion for law and legislation and, and DM, uh, I, I, I generally found it's just about having an evidence-based argument with someone, just in terms of, you know, whether a planning application is acceptable, appeals, etc. You know, working with the public quite a lot in terms of pre-apps to get um, applications in a good state before they get submitted very, very busy, probably learned more than I ever have in and being thrown in. I mean, my first day at Sunderland, never having seen a planning application in my life, I had 10 on my desk that I was the case officer for, a few of which were about to expire because they'd just been allocating them to me. But again, you know, lots of good fun, but maybe smaller applications I was dealing with, so mainly household, household so extensions or, or the odd single dwelling. So next slide. Uh, then I got chartered, uh, managed that quite quickly. Again, I won't dwell on this. The best thing about being chartered was I got a pay rise at the time, but also it meant that I was considered an expert in my field. So giving evidence at public inquiry, et cetera, was one of the main things that becoming chartered uh, uh, really, really helped with. Um, next slide, please. Then a very short stint at Durham County Council as a minerals planning officer. So I went from very small applications to massive ones. Um, but again, uh, I did a bit of work here, but realized, uh, again, we've got someone else who, who's done minerals and planning, so I, I won't dwell too much, but really different issues. You know, you're looking at applications that are over years and years. It's um, really complicated, difficult stuff. But then also with the county council, and this was before unitarization, they also dealt with county matters applications. So basically the council's own applications, things like schools, etc. Um, next slide. 
Then I moved to London, which meant I went into the private sector. So I uh, spent a lot of time there. I basically went to the private sector because I, I wanted to move to London. It was the only way I could afford it. But really, uh, they found me quite attractive because of my DM experience and the council experience and knowing how to deal with councils and knowing the dark arts of development management, which is mainly about how you get a planning officer to actually answer the phone. Um, but, you know, this was quite good film with some really big schemes. So I worked on Arsenal. Uh, at, uh, the Emirates Stadium and also King Alfred, uh, which was uh, never built, but the first Frank Gehry project to be granted consent in, in England. Uh, next slide, please. So financial crisis here, I'll be honest, I wasn't uh, enamored with the private sector. It, it, it wasn't quite for me, but I had bills to pay. So I never really looked at moving. I was made redundant through the financial crisis. At the time, it was the end of the world, but actually it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. So if we move on to the next slide. Uh, well, I went into the third sector, so joined Planning Aid for London at the time the coalition government came in. So uh, using money there to promote localism, but also giving planning advice to communities that couldn't afford their own planning consultants. And I think this is where I started realised realize actually this is what I wanted to do, actually, uh, you know, working with communities, improving people's lives, etc. So next slide which involved me moving to the Royal Town Planning Institute where I headed up Planning Aid England and um, uh, delivered on, on the government's uh, uh, neighbourhood planning agenda that was introduced for the Localism Act. So again, I got a lot of management experience at the RTPI, working with a lot of volunteers, but actually where I started writing guidance and support, putting planning speak into play in English and trying to get communities engaged with the planning system and empower them to actually develop their own areas, whether that was through a neighborhood plan or not. Um, next slide, please. And this is where I am now, and I'll, I'll probably just spend uh, just a minute on this. So, so, so at the ministry, I, I joined the civil service about four years ago. It was something I always wanted to get into. Um, I joined as a, 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 a grade seven, which is essentially a team leader. And, and, and now I'm, I, I, I have progressed and I'm, I'm grade six head of um, development plan delivery. It's always interesting with these slides because ministers change quite often. So you can see here, I've, I've, I've put the ministers up on our Secretary of State, as well as our, our recently appointed um, Chief Planner. But every day is different in the civil service. It's incredibly exciting, but I go beyond planning. So I'm doing more than just planning work. I'm doing housing work. I, I touch on a number of areas, whether it's local government, um, but mainly I'm in charge of getting plans in place, whether that's the London plan or small local plans, um, as well as dealing with um, planning reform I'm feeding into, uh, given my, my interest in local plans. And also basically, any policy in the department that comes forward, obviously I need to push uh, local plans and make sure that they, you know, they are, they are, well, not necessarily front and centre, but at least make sure that they're taken into account and into consideration. Uh, next slide, please. I get to go to interesting places for meetings. Uh, I, 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 I can't say that I met the Prime Minister personally, but, but obviously I, I have had a nosy around, um, at, well, at least number 10 rather than his, his residence, which I believe is above uh, number 11. But again, I mean, I just pinch myself each morning walking down Whitehall to work. Well, I haven't done for a year, but hopefully sometime soon. And uh, just uh, next slide, please. And I, I promise I am nearly done now. And just, as I say, just some of the exciting stuff I get to do. Um, if you can see at the back in the box, that the person who seems to be looking down at his phone, that, that's me, um, uh, actually was texting with, with ministers about, um, ab about the speech that was about to be given. And you can see there at the back, that's Priti Patel at the time, who was a backbencher leading the debate. She's obviously now our Home Secretary. And my minister at the time leading this debate was uh, no other than Rishi Sunak, which is obviously now the Chancellor of the Exchequer. But he, uh, you know, uh, uh, two ministerial appointments prior to that, he was, he, he, he was a minister within, within, within the ministry. Um, that's it for me. I mean, one thing I will say is, you know, I've had a varied career, but I, I promise you on every single job I've ever gone into, I think the last, the next slide encapsulates how I feel and um, you really should not be worried about that. I mean, any job I go into, it, it takes a while to learn it, but you pick it up. And one thing I've found is I think don't be scared to take risks and actually go for what you want. Um, and that's it for me. And apologies, I think I've only gone twice over the time. I think there was no way you're going to cover all of that in the time anyway, but that's that's amazing. I'm excited to get into that in even more detail. So, Jim? Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, interesting path into uh, 
into planning for me, very similar to John's. I'm, I'm quite scarily similar trajectory, even Sunderland University. I mean, I, I joined Warwickshire just as um, he was leaving, I think. My, anyway, uh, geologist by education, planner by accident, and then now devoted planner act. Um, yeah, I fell into it. So, um, and that's me at Gwynfinnith Gold Mine uh, in, in 96. So uh, I'm twice the man I was then. So if you next slide. Yeah, I'll just run through very quickly what I did, then I'll go through the details. Uh, so I started off applied geology at Sunderland uh, a long time ago, moved into mineral exploration at Leicester University after a year out, earning money to, to sort of fund that. Um, that's where I wanted to go, uh, you know, mining companies across the world. I did my dissertation at Gwynfinnith um, and then sort of fell off the radar a little bit. I ended up get, going back home to Leamington, sort of Coventry, um, working in spares and sales at, at Thwa uh, Thwaites Dumpers, if you've ever seen them. And uh, did that for a few years and then had a bit of a mid-life, well, early life crisis. And uh, by luck, ended up at Warwickshire. Uh, as a minerals and waste planner, trainee assistant. I think I was the oldest trainee assistant planner ever, which was, uh, which was all right. Um, and then while I was there, they, they pay for my MSc in planning uh, down at Oxford. Uh, the brook should be in very tiny type. That should say Oxford University. Um, and then sort of at Warwickshire, went from DM work in minerals planning into a sort of minerals policy, had a, had a crack at that for a few, for a few years. And then moved to the agency as a regional planner from what I sort of get, getting a more of an interest in regional planning, broader, wider, similar sort of issues in the water environment from, from quarries, quarry restorations and what have you. And at the agency, I went from regional to national, worked at the national team where I worked with uh, John's colleagues, CLG uh, or, um, and the uh, cabinet office on a few things. Uh, and then back to my area, uh, West Midlands area as the planning team leader. Uh, which impressed my team, I think, one of which is on the call. Um, and, uh, and then from there, I'm now taking a sort of secondment out to look at our strategic work, what we're doing, uh, how we're going forwards in, the, in, in planning the agency in my area uh, with various budget cuts and green recoveries and, and what have you. So um, I'll go through in a little bit more detail on the next slide. Yeah, so when I started at Warwickshire, uh, day one straight off a forklift into uh, development management. I didn't have 10 applications. We're not quite as busy on the minerals, but there's a couple of uh, sites, a couple of uh, applications to deal with from day one, all very scary. Um, suddenly in, in, a, in, a, um, in a room full of people from highways to uh, planners, people negotiating tourism at you know, Warwickshire. Uh, and, and the one thing I did gain a lot from was how uh, planners tend to be one happy band because everyone is out to get you. You are nobody's friend. You never make a decision that's people that, every, that pleases everybody and you look after your own. And that, that team spirit really, really got me uh, going, got me settled at Warwickshire, uh, grew in confidence. Um, I went to quite a few uh, presentations, uh, got myself out there actually, because I knew I was sort of uh, behind the clock a bit on the career, career path. Um, and what uh, I won't, uh, yeah, I will say this because it's, um, because uh, I need Warwickshire needed me more than I needed them. I found out because they needed a minerals person from my geology background. That's what they wanted. So I could have stuck it out for a lot more money uh, when I joined. Um, so I, I helped the policy team in DM uh, when I was in DM, and then I moved into planning policy uh, lockstock and did three consultation documents, um, all of which were widely uh, received um, by the public. Um, who love minerals especially and blame you for everything and there was one i made the headlines in the paper a few times for the wrong reasons you are blamed for everything not my quarries it's the it's the you know semex or you know we're just facilitating but that that yeah that uh, it doesn't suit everybody uh but standing in front of a parish council uh whether it be six or 200 um you 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 learn your spurs and and you make a mess of it and, you, and you, your team gather around you or your manager puts his arm around you and you do it again and you get the hang of it and people just want to sort of vent off at you half the time so taking that experience sort of from from uh, from the policy and wanting to get out expand a bit more we've done a lot of work on planet on uh, catchment uh, catchment planning with the quality restorations it really interested me water environment how to integrate quality restorations the holes in the ground 
And that led me into regional planning at the agency. A job came up, I, I um, applied, I got it. Um, and day one, I got the East and West Midlands regional spatial strategies to deal with. The East Midlands having just gone back into review because of the Lincolnshire coast uh, caused a few ructions. Uh, so that was they just dumped on me. But again, team around you, uh, the agency uh, made you feel so supported uh, and you just your confidence is there. You just remember it. And then I was working on um, the emerging regional spatial strategies, working with, uh, as was Government Office West Midlands, the regional assemblies, AW, AWM, all these have now gone sort of replaced by LEPS, give or take, or, or Beige uh, and, and MHCLG. Um, and I got from talking about uh, minerals to suddenly talking about housing, strategic housing sites, the strategic housing numbers, uh, and how that integrated into the environment. Um, and that's how we sort of, that's what got me really interested, how we could get the, uh, how you get the environment into talks on economics and talks about housing uh, and really promoting the role. And uh, that's what that got me going. Um, and then while I was at the region, we, I ended up supporting a few of my area colleagues uh, with some EIPs, uh, one of which was a car crash. Uh, the other two went, went much better, North Lincolnshire and rugby. Uh, and, and again, I learned a lot of Coventry when it went absolutely pear-shaped and I got absolutely savaged by the inspector and uh, head of planning at Coventry, but we learned our mistakes. Uh, don't trust Seven Trent was one of them. Uh, no. <laughs> no, it was, uh, we objected to Seven Trent's uh, uh, treatment works because it couldn't take the housing numbers. Uh, but what we hadn't done was negotiated was talk to Seven Trent enough, and we learned a lot from that. So we learned never to object on someone else's asset. So from then on, uh, and then what we took into the regional spatial strategy was working in collaboration with all our partners, Natural England, Seven Trent. Uh, you learn the hard way, um, but that's what happens. You know, you you, you pick yourself up, you carry on. Um, and then I got got interested in the catchment planning. As regional spatial strategies disappeared um, with government changes, I was sort of on the, in the vanguard of the LEP formations uh, and around uh, sort of duty to cooperate. Did a few talks to one, one with the planning, uh, planning advisory service and TCPA did a few of them. How duty to cooperate tackles the environment. How you do rivers, rivers don't respect political boundaries. How do we uh, promote catchment, catchment scale issues without a regional spatial strategy? Uh, then I moved, as regions were binned, our regional teams finally sort of dissolved. I went into the national team. Um, I part, uh, we, we sort of landed the cost recovery for planning advice that the agency hadn't done before. That was, that was on me. Um, I took part in the government's red tape challenge, uh, representing the agency on minerals and waste. So that was really good, going to talk to, uh, talk to cabinet office and all the, all the very civil servants, high up civil servants and linking with industry. And being the balance between a regulator and industry and government, that was really interesting times. Um, and then from, from the national role, I took a job at team, uh, team leader back in the area to get back in the trenches, really, um, and sort of lead a team. Uh, we do planning applications. We do this sort of local plan work. Uh, I try and help them or did try and help them while I was, while I was team leader. Uh, and we do the, sort of the, the, the nuts and bolts of what the agency does. And then try and get ourselves in under the sort of into the economic world to land our message better, not to be just seen as a regulator, but really get into the green growth now, and really get uh, you get taken seriously by by industry if you talk their language or understand where they're coming from. And now I'm just looking at the strategic planning role, the future direction of where we go at the agency it, within my area, um, how we brigade our resources, what we focus on. You know, where we target, where we prioritise, uh, and, and it is basically to underpin the green growth. And on the back of that, you can try and get uh, water framework directive benefits and, and flood risk uh, benefits, but, you know, someone else is possibly paying and you're enabling growth. So, yeah, varied, varied career path, and I'll, and I'll leave it there. Thank you, Jim. It's great to hear such a, such a range of experience within the Environment Agency and that you've been able to sort of bring your you know, geology background into into a planning role and I think there's quite a few uh, geography students actually on the call today so they'll be interested in always look for the planning jobs I mean I, I, I forgot to say I represent the, the environment agency on the UK minerals forum 
So I, I sit there with all the, with the head of CBI Minerals and you know, see very important people in government, and uh, I try and pretend I know what I'm talking about. But uh, there is vast opportunities in minerals planning. They are always crying out they haven't got enough mineral planners coming through, whether they've got the resources in the uh, in the county councils to uh, to employ them. But they're big big opportunities there for geologists. We'll get into that later on as well. Um, and our next slide is from Sarah. Evening, everyone. So I'm Sarah Adams and I work for Malvern Hills and Whitshaven District Councils as their Rural Housing Enabler. So I fell into planning as well after I finished a geography um, as an undergrad and particularly enjoyed the planning side of it. So I started my career as a um, strategic land graduate for a land promoter. Um, and then I completed my urban and regional planning masters last year at the University of Birmingham. So I'm relatively new compared to the other two in this panel, but um, I was working full time as well. So it was a, a great achievement to get that done, especially with everything that's happened in the last year. And so, so um, I've recently took the plunge to move from um, private to public sector, which I'm sure we'll discuss more in the Q&A session. So I'll leave that bit out. Um, so can I next slide, please? So just a little bit about my role as Rural Housing Enabler Officer. So at the councils, we recognise the benefits of affordable housing in rural areas and how it can improve the sustainability and help promote mixed and inclusive rural communities. So that's the pretty bit about my role is to just try and promote more housing for the need of the area. So they want to, I want to encourage rural communities to assess their own housing need and future need for their long-term sustainability. So I provide support, information and advice to local communities and groups and act as a go-between between between the community, the local authority and other key stakeholders. Um, So community engagement is a key part of my role and working with parish councils, community-led housing groups and local residents to understand the development process. So that's how I bring in my old job as um, land promoter um, and planner through into this role in the housing side. So I'd identify where there's a need for affordable housing in the district and get the community engaged. Um, But one of the biggest challenges is finding suitable sites for these developments and the site site finding process that comes with it, that you need to find a site that's policy compliant, backed by the community and has a landowner that's willing to um, sell at affordable price is very difficult and can take a long time. Um, Next slide, please. So a key part of my role is identifying affordable housing needs. So there's a few different types. Um, This is usually done through either the the SHMAR, um, which provides an overview of all housing need in the district, um, the council's register, which can provide evidence of local connection to a parish but has limited information, or the housing needs survey that is a paper or electronic copy survey that goes to every single household in the parish. Um, Next slide, please. So another part of my role is working with developers and housing associations to identify what affordable housing tenures is needed for their development. So um, that's just working with a wide range of people that I think coming from um, planning background, you know um, what to expect from the um, private side as well as public side. So I think I kept mine quite short, but <laughs> I'll leave on. Thank you. Well, that's great to hear as well. I'm sure all the students will be really invigorated to know that you've managed to get a job straight out of the course. Um, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions on how you did it later on as well in the Q&A. So thank you, Sarah. Thanks. Right, I'm Varel. Oh, hi, Camille. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, can you hear me? Hi, Camille. Yeah, cool. Um, so. I'm Viral Desai, I'm a principal town planner. I work for a company called Atkins. Uh, Atkins is a multidisciplinary um, engineering, all the facets that put together a development. Um, and we, we pretty much do everything that, <laughs> that a global engineering company would do. So we have um, a few of us, um, there's about 40 town planners um, across the, the the whole of the, the company um, in the UK. We're based out of Birmingham, um, Warrington, London, and Bristol. Um, in Birmingham, we have a team of uh, eight people, um, a few principal planners, a few senior planners, um, and a number of um, junior planners as well, so planners and assistant planners. 
uh, and we do a varied amount of work. So my team work on HS2, East West Rail um, in the region, um, and, and we're currently working on the Commonwealth Games projects as well, um, and trying to get consent for the organising committee for a number of um, number of schemes. Um, so we work across both development management and policy-led projects. Um, so we have this sort of varied, varied role that, that really encompasses all areas of planning that, that the, the people have sort of described um, before. And, and we sort of get involved in a little bit of everything uh, as planning consultants. Um, so my background is, is that I graduated from the University of Liverpool. Um, I started off like everyone else, probably uh, as a geography student, and I didn't fall into planning like the other people said. I actually chose this career, uh, and uh, it's an interesting, a very interesting career that um, I think for all students to sort of know, you know, and I think there's something that the other um, speakers have said is about learning, like massively amount of learning goes on on a day-to-day -day basis. They, I haven't got a clue what I'm going to be doing tomorrow and I'll lay in what I'm doing as I'm going uh, and hopefully know what I'm doing uh, as I move into the to next week. Um, but yeah, like I say, so I did the Masters, um, Master's Civic Design at the University of Liverpool as well and then graduated and I actually started my career in local government. So I was on the Shropshire Council Graduate Scheme um, for a year or so, uh, working in planning but also doing graduate-led projects um, across uh, the council related to, to, to change and change culture with within local government. So it was quite quite an interesting role where you were doing planning, but then you were doing other elements as well um, around adult and social care and helping the, the organisation change. It was, it, was really, it was a really interesting graduate scheme. Um, since then, uh, over the nine years that I've been doing this, I've worked in private sector. And I've worked in a number of uh, companies similar to, one similar to Atkins, one was a residential, more residential focused, focused organisation down in London. So I've moved between the Midlands and London over the last sort of 10 years or so, which you probably tell by accent, I'm not from this area, but I've sort of moved back to Shropshire three times in my life. So it's quite, quite interesting. It keeps drawing me back. Um, so I joined Atkins about four years ago um, and have been working um, with them on a varied amount of sort of sectors and projects. I'm glad there's a minerals planner here because uh, I do love a bit of waste and minerals uh, and I haven't, haven't done any of that work for a long time, but I think it's very interesting kind of work. Um, I've worked on residential projects, commercial projects, but my, my real passion is in infrastructure. And I've worked over the last four years on the two schemes in the middle here. Uh, one of them is the Wilver Neweth um, DCO project, which is a nuclear power station, which unfortunately is 16 billion pound away from, from actually getting uh, consent. Um, and it didn't get consent a couple of weeks ago, but that is the, the project that I worked on for a couple of years, which I'm super proud of. It's sort of where I've got my real skills around planning in terms of leadership and decision making, not just all the kind of strategic things that we do on a regular basis, but those business related skills that are also added into our day to day work. And then the, the, the middle picture at the bottom there is um, M25 Junction 10, which is a project I worked on last year, again, leading 50 people through an examination process over um, uh, over the, the whole year to actually deliver to um, highways England, uh, deliver to the planning inspectorate um, all the material that goes into um, a DCO examination. Um, and the other two projects just sort of reflect the kind of varied work that, that consultants do. We, you know, we don't just work in sort of one area. Although my passion is in infrastructure, um, the, the scheme on the right hand side there is a, is a residential scheme I'm working at the moment um, for 350 homes. And then on the left hand side is um, Edge Baston Stadium, which is one of the Commonwealth Games um, venues, which we've been working on over the last sort of six months as well. Um, so very, very piece of role, but also I like to get involved in the institution and I get, like to get involved in the RTPI, and I'm currently a member of the RTPI England Policy Panel, um, which helps to sort of advise on where policy is going in the UK. And there's a massive policy shift, uh, as John will know, and probably working on quite considerably uh, at the moment within, within the sector. Um, and it is a very interesting time, as I'm sure John will come on to, in coming, becoming a town planner in this maybe new planning system that we're going to see in the next few years. Um, but just to finish, you know, I think planning is one of the most interesting professions. And I think planning consultancy is one of the most interesting elements of that. Every day is different. During this whole lockdown over the last year, I've worked all over the country, not just in the region. 
Um, and if I just give you a bit of a flavor of my day today, I've worked on a bid for a railway project. I have had a wash up session for a DCO examination deadline, which was yesterday. Um, we discussed with clients about section 106 agreement on a number of residential schemes. Uh, and I've actually been trying to sell my business. I've been trying to put together a bit of a business plan with a number of my other colleagues around what do our service lines look like, not just planning, but how does that interface with air quality, eco ecology, all the various elements that go into a planning application. So I just want to finish on planning consultancy is amazing. And if um, you guys want to get involved, I'm, I'm sure we'll get into a bit more information about it as we go through on the Q&A. Come here. So back over to you. Thank you, Pat Perrell. Um, I mean, if I wasn't already sold on Atkins, I am now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great to hear such a variety of work that you uh, do. Um, so I'm just going to move us on to the um, question section. So the, the main part is the discussion. Um, and so I'd like to sort of ask, I guess we'll start with John, um, and then we'll make our way around the panel. So if you could sort of try and limit the jargon, as I know there's a variety of sort of levels of, um, you know, planners <laughs> right now in terms of students. Um, but so what particular skills does your role require um, and how do you decide the job is right for you? So if we just sort of follow the order of our presentations. But John, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, I saw why it was right for me. I mean, it was, it was mainly just because I think I was, I, I, I have a love of politics um, and, you know, the civil service was something obviously that gives you direct interaction with that. I, I also, when I was at RTPI, was doing a lot of work with the civil service on, on, on contracts that we had with them, mainly the neighbour planning one, which is actually how I met Kat Salter. Um, and I was just incredibly impressed at just the calibre and the ability of, of people within the civil service. Um, so, you know, it, it just felt right. So that, that, that's why I decided uh, uh, to move in there. And I, I did talk to a lot of people about it before, before I went. But in terms of the skills, I mean, actually, in terms of civil servant and the generalist civil servant, I think actually there's a lot of transferable skills uh, from what you learn as a planner, which I think make you an excellent civil servant. Uh, so I'm a tech planner. Um, and I'm chartered, and that is a requirement of my, my of my post. Not all planners within the planning director of MHCLG are planners. I'd say it's probably about twenty percent. Um, but you know, the, the fact that I brought skills and views and lived experience from the outside world, as it were, did make it. Um, uh, uh, you know, it was quite quite attractive um, uh, to, to 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 employ me. But in terms of what you need, I mean, ability to write and speak in plain English. You know, you are dealing with uh, senior civil servants, with ministers, with MPs, with the general public. So you have to know your audience and you have to, be able to put complicated planning things into very plain English. So, you know, submissions, such as, you know, that's quite a scary thing, sending advice. But, you know, I always try and keep it to two sides, keep it as concise as possible. Um, so that's that's quite that's quite important. So good written and communication skills. I also think seeing the big picture is also vastly important in, in, in my role to understand the political landscape, to be able to just see beyond what you're actually doing, what, what the wider implications are and to think strategically. Also, you know, I, I have to be uh, politically neutral. Um, so, you know, being aware, as I say, it's like the big picture, being aware of who your ministers are and who you're advising. But, you know, there are obviously policies I would put forward to our Secretary of State that I wouldn't if maybe it was a different political party that was that was forming the government. So being fully aware of that and I think, you know, knowing your area, knowing your policy and I think almost being able to second guess your ministers in terms of what they may ask for just so you've got it ready made because you really are working uh, to very, very tight time scales. Some of them are, are, are really quite upsetting. It's great when you get a bit of space to do some work, but uh, you don't always get granted that. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll pause there just, just in terms of time so others can come in. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, maybe we'll stick to the, the number one most important unique skill for your job. Um, Jim, if you want to carry that on then. Uh, <laughs> number one important skill. Um, I think it's, it's understanding where other people are coming from. Uh, you will be talking to parish councils, you will be talking to developers, and you will be talking to elected members. Uh, and everyone has their own opinions. Everyone has their own uh, fears, worries, uh, and you have to understand that and you have to balance that. I mean, the, the, 
the te technical term is planning is a balance of social and economic and, and, and everything, but it, it really is on a day-to-day on -day basis and, and how you talk to people. You, if you can understand where they're coming from, you might think they're wrong. <laughs> and I, this is being recorded, so I'll have to be careful what I say. But you have to, you, if you understand what motivates people, if you understand where they're coming from and what, and what their drivers are, and that might be profit ultimately with the private sector, whatever, you know, that is going to come down to that. But it's not the be all and end all. And parish councils, they just don't want something, maybe. They just don't want whatever colour or look, look of those houses are, they, they're not going to go for it. But there's a, there's a position in the middle and you're not going to keep... Everyone's not going to be happy but as long as you understand and take the time to understand where people are coming from, I think I think you're halfway there. And then you can learn the technical issues and the policies and all that that comes through. But just be open minded and um, just take on board what people say. A real soft skill to it then in that case. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think I'd add to that and say that it's like li listening skills. And definitely um, through working with different groups, um, community groups and parish councils, um, making sure that you listen to what they want and what what development could bring to their area is really important. Um, to also add to that problem solving as a planner, there's always something that comes up that um, is a bit seems like a bit of a brick wall at the time, but there's always a way around. So I think that's a very important skill to have. Varel, uh, unique skill, or the number one yeah. unique skill. I just just to follow Sarah there, so I think problem solving and, and collaboration are the, are the sort of most important sort of skills for a planner. Every day you're faced with like a new issue, whether that's, you know, a DM solution, policy solution, but also for planning consultant around the business management, development of those solutions, team management. I think there's a few team leaders there as well. How do we solve issues with, with our own team? So technical challenges as well as business challenges, you know, they all require this leadership and communication and, and collaboration. Um, but I just, just want to add something as well about personality. I think collaboration sometimes fits people's personalities. And if you're going to, to be a town planner, I think it, it's sort of, um, that's one of the reasons I love my job is that I like to collaborate with people. And I think that's quite important uh, part, of, part, of the, part of the role and part of being a planning consultant and a planner. That's great to hear. Obviously, planning then includes a lot of talking and listening, clearly, from what we've heard. Um, I'm just going to put two questions together just so that we get through on time. Um, so I'd like to ask you, all, um, what's the best thing about your job? And also, what's the best project that you've worked on? Also, what you're proud to achieve? achievement um, in that job as well uh, the best thing about my current job um i think i think it's it's where i've come from <laughs> it, geology background um and wanted to do and minerals planning pure and simple and then i'm i'm now um you know looking at houses and and, and regeneration um and the best that that sort of diversity is is the best thing i think and and but moving into that social issues now the social what the environment can bring into social um and was it the proudest achievement was that was that bundled up as well very quickly standing in front of 220 minerals minerals industry representatives at the, at the uh, rtpi mpa awards and taking tomatoes but facing them up 220 uh we are the enemy they don't we regulate as well we're not just planners we're regulators uh, and they don't particularly we don't yeah water and inert waste uh that was good and then but the other proudest achievement was was we did resolve the Lincolnshire coastal issue on strategic housing uh, with the RSS for five minutes before they scrapped regional spatial strategies. But that was really we managed to get the three councils, and I, I I will claim that I did did a lot of that. But that we're working with others. But that that was the proudest achievement to get those three coastal communities to agree to uh, housing numbers that they could live with that gave them the growth and we could live with from a, from a flood risk side of things. So that was really good. And it minerals to housing to regeneration. It's, it's all there if you want it. I'm sure Sarah can agree about collaboration between councils being important. I'm just gonna see if John, is your wife all right now? Yeah, it is. So it was a question, proudest achievement? Yeah, that's it. Well, I mean, it's been quite a few, but I'll probably just take something relatively recently. So it's basically over COVID during lockdown. So obviously a year ago, absolute nightmare. The department was front and centre at the response on that. So, you know, 
loads of civil servants within the department being deployed to deal with the response. Now, I can't take credit for that. That wasn't me, but but lost half 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 you know half a team for a, for a temporary period as we we gave up resource to deal with a national emergency. But but obviously during that, I think it was just supporting my colleagues, making sure that you know during difficult times with with additional work that they were well supported. And as part of that, I took on other work. So I actually delivered a uh, part of the business and planning bill, um, uh, just in terms of how that deals with consultation during um, during lockdown, and took forward a couple of uh, statutory instruments of secondary legislation as well, which basically allowed local planning authorities to be able to consult on local plans without the need for putting you know hard copies on deposit, etc. So so basically keeping the planning system moving during what was a national crisis. So and I only contributed a small part, but that's probably what I'm most proud of. That sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah, Sarah. So the best thing about my current job, um, I'd say just working with a mixture of people um, from all walks of back and backgrounds. It's kind of a um, different thing from working for a um, land promoter with working with consultants and being the bad guy. I've turned into the um, person that everyone wants to be friends with. It's just a very, it's very different, and I, <laughs> I'm sure other people would back me up who have been who've worked for both. You, um, it's. It, very different um, and my personal um, greatest achievement is just complete my master's whilst working full-time um, and during a pandemic I thought that, that's pretty good so all students it's just well done for getting through it um, it's just a great achievement and you should be all proud of yourself anyway. It's a great inspiration for us yeah thank you. Rob? Yeah, I think the best part of my my job, I think, is just the varied nature of, of 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 the work that I have on on my plate. Where you know, at times I have five or six different types of projects that I can be dipping in and out of to to sort of work. But I think it's working with people to actually deliver those, and that that's what makes I think that's the best part of my job and um, and problem solving and making things happen for whether it's a client or internally for 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 the business. I think that's probably the best thing about um, for me being a town planner. I think. The best moment or the proudest moment was 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 getting a letter from a client i actually got a letter from a client last year and i was like this is amazing i've never even received a letter in the last sort of 10 years or whatever and I, it was a letter sort of just to say how well um the, the, the examination that we were on with hybrid england went so i had to manage about 50 people um through the process I had to manage about four different organizations and their inputs into that examination and i set up this sort of own process that i had and i was just you know just to receive something like that which is you know someone's took the time to actually acknowledge what you had done and you'd spent a year of your life trying to do and i think that's pretty good that's pretty kind it's pretty proud of that as i guess as a benefit of um being in consultancy as well that variety then that you mentioned earlier yeah definitely the variety um, so into the sort of the meatiest question um of the ones on the list um that's sort of you know you've all worked across the different sectors of public and private and john obviously the third sector as well in planning aid um i'd like to sort of get into you know what are the main differences in um in how you work and see um we sort of mentioned you know working for people and being the good guy or the bad guy but um maybe some more detail about you know your personal experiences transitioning um between those roles so i know john you mentioned going from savills um, into planning aid and then eventually makes it be so yeah, just to touch on your your experiences of working across different sectors and how they differ and what students should really consider um whether you know they're the right fit or for a certain sector or not public sector is probably where where i want to be but you know there i love the civil service but getting your head around it and there's very specific ways of working not just acronyms but certain terminology that they use that is incredibly interesting and they just kind of assume you know because that's all they've ever known so um so yeah th th those i think what, what what the differences are for me water resources has got more than acronyms than clg can put together so uh, if you ever work in water resources i haven't got a clue what they say um I've worked in, the, in two aspects of the public sector, one responsible to elected members at the county council and one basically a regulator, an, ar an arm of the government. Uh, very different um, elected members are, um, yeah, you need to know how to, uh, what they're after and what they need. And it's, it, yeah, it can be very rewarding. Uh, it, it does test you, test your way to explain things. Um, you, are, you are explaining it to people that are politically motivated and, and, and they're not professional planners a lot of them they're not uh, they are representing their constituents uh, with the agency I am 
yeah, we are regulator. We have a certain political uh, sort of uh, obligation to, to sort of stick toe the line and, and do what, what government policy states. Um, and how we deal with the public, with the private sector, uh, we and um, they are mo they have to make profit, otherwise they don't exist. Yeah, you, we understand that they're not they're not charities, um, and it's trying to get a compromise. They, their motivation is is is, is profit. Some are. Um, uh, it'll be recorded here. So, <laughs> um, but we know that they, they, if they don't make a profit, they don't last, and we don't get development that we need to make our rivers better. So there is a compromise there. There is an answer there, and it's just again, it comes back to understanding what people's motivations are and where that common ground is. You know, we won't get flood defences if we don't get housing. A lot of the time, they pay for the flood defences. They pay for the environmental improvements, uh, and we can't go in hard-handed regulation and stopping everything no 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 um and so but they they can't just you know no regulation and just do what they want there there is middle ground there and society will benefit if we get out if we work together better that was a very long-winded way of saying work together wasn't it <laughs> that's the tribulations i guess of you know working in a developer-led system you're sort of at the disposal of what's what's on offer and what's being proposed um, and it's interesting that you say you know it's different in the public sector that you have to sort of talk to politicians and people who aren't exactly planners by trade or experts in that field um so i wonder sarah if you want to add to that actually in, in your public sector role too yeah so it just it's it's making use of your good communication skills as well and making sure you do speak in plain english so people don't leave a meeting not understanding what you wanted to say and what you were what you're doing um I also think that another main difference between public and private is geographic knowledge um, from working in both. When I was for working for Land Promoter, I was able, I was working all around the country, whereas now I'm working in two district council areas and that's pretty much it, which is very strange for me. Um, but I think it's also, there's also a big difference between work-life balance as well in two different um, the two different sectors, um, but I won't say more, too much more on that. <laughs> so, Varel, um, you know, your work now in the private sector compared to what you were doing previously in, in city councils? Yeah, so I think in terms of difference, they, they both pose different challenges. So you've got public service versus your client goals, and you, you are a bit, as a planner, intrinsically, you're a bit challenged by both because you, you do have that innate I want to help the public all the time, but you still have your client goals that you need to achieve and whether, you know, it's achieved, making sure they achieve 20% on their, their, their site or whatever. So there's a bit of conflict there, I think, for, for a planner generally, but I feel like goals are, are the same for both. So we're trying to create better places for people to live within. And I think that is the same thing that we're all trying to do, but one is driven by a client and the other one is maybe driven by public and politics and the two chaps uh, out all of you who, who are working in the public sector I'm just so glad I don't have to deal with the politics in my daily life I, I think I, I would say some out of 10 and probably get fired to be honest uh, <laughs> but I can't I, I do commend you guys for really just what you guys do in the public sector around that sort of daily life um, but I think um, we're regularly collaborating with our public sector colleagues and I think that is a key point just to highlight that we are we both have the same issue and that's resource constraint as well I think but the planning industry generally has this resource constraint and whether you're in the public sector or the private sector that that is going to impact but I think collaboration is still key across the two sort of sectors and and we always see I always feel like when we're working with officers when we're submitting our um, schemes that we're working with them in collaboration to deliver something and solve issues and I think that that's one of the key bits um, for me. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I think we've picked up a lot of soft skills there, which is going to be my next question, you know, collaboration, listening to people and especially in the public sector, John and Jim and Sarah, you mentioned being able to sort of communicate in plain English um, and also being responsible for the public, I guess, as a public servant in some way. Um, so I think we'll move on to my last question, then we'll get on to the Q&A just so we stick to close to time. Um, and so the final question would be to you all, um, what do you know now that you would sort of wish you'd known previously when you were a student or early on in your career? What sort of advice would you give back to somebody just getting started in planning? Yeah, so I mean, 
I'll be really brief on this one, but I'll just say a bit more direction in terms of what I wanted to do and more experience before charting my career, I think would have been useful because I spent a lot of time just trying stuff out, which is kind of fun. But some of those things I can do without, you know, I won't get those years that time back. So, you know, having some thoughtful consideration and just testing things out, I think. And I, I think also that it's just not the end of the world if you don't get the dream job you want. You know, I found myself redundant. I've I've uh, failed at getting jobs, but then I've, I've got jobs that I thought, uh, which actually have turned out to be amazing. So I think, never think it's the end of the world. There will always be another job and that dream job will appear at some point. I think just, you know, be calm, thoughtful, considerate and don't make knee jerk reactions unless you really, really have to. Um, I, I will say, I wish I'd known that it was a mineral planner shortage when I joined Warwickshire. I could have, could have been a different world um, for me. Um, the, the soft skills. Um, um, I think it's it, it, yeah. You're talking. You're listening to people. And if as a planner, if you keep broad-minded, I, I started in minerals, and I'm I'm now really interested in urban regeneration and the role that environment plays into that. That that's the journey. And and next, it could be you know, I, yeah yeah. You've got all options open. You could go and work for the for the government. You could take and for a charity. You could go completely eco ecological. You could go and you know, join Arab or, or somewhere and, and go into housing. You could join you know the uh, Vassimians, the Bovises, uh, to try and sort of take what you know into the next phase. So it, it keeps coming. It keeps changing. Just you don't have to stay doing the same thing. And there will always be opportunities if you're broad-minded. And as John said, if you get dumped on your backside. You just pick yourself up and, and get going again because there will be opportunities uh private public charity um you know it, it's, i don't know um yeah sorry went a bit off at the end there <laughs> no, that's good that's good and it's reassuring i think to hear that you can you know you don't have to commit to one role um i think john was definitely the primest example possible of that of being able to move around but this was actually a worry that i had recently and i spoke to brad about and i said you know what if i don't get a grad scheme or what if i don't end up in the right company and the, the truth is that, you know, you can constantly move around in the sector. And Brown, remember you told me that once you're, you've been hired, then you're actually more hireable. Yep. People, you know, scout you. And that really reassured me as well. And also the fact that you can bring any skills from a certain planning world to another one was really important. So I'll let you pick that back up, uh, back up on that in a bit, Brown. But Sarah, any advice to your younger self at the start of your career? Yeah. Not long ago, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to add to the other other. Uh, um, panelists points it's just don't put too much pressure on yourself to get that dream job um, all parts of planning um, come together to help form your planning knowledge and even if you're doing something I don't know um, something just very 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 lightly touching on planning you could then touch on those skills in another job and you'll think oh yes I used to do that um, I know what those people are going through and you can bring it through to your next role um, so yeah so if you don't get your dream job just keep trying and I'm sure that there'll be something out there that will um, help you get to where you want to be maybe later on but don't just don't put too much pressure on yourself yeah reiterate the same sort of things um that the other panelists have sort of said there um one of the things i was going to say was the point that you raised as well um camilla you know just just take your time you know you will learn things as you go forward and you can apply them to different sectors don't feel like you are you know you might go and work for a residential planning consultancy and you you're a residential planner for the rest of your life no that's not the case you, you you've got the skills that will hopefully then move you into wherever you want to go so don't feel like you're you're pigeonholed even within the sector and um, i think similarly i i came into the industry in in 2011 and there were still not many roles after the end of the recession around for, for graduates and junior planners and that's why i ended up in shropshire because you know i'd love to be in liverpool but I, I took a bit of a choice that i wanted to to get in there and do things um and start my career so i did move um and but what i, I would just say is that don't rush and learn is, is just one thing and for me if you ask me today something about PD rights or something about uh, <laughs> can I get plan of permission for a garage or whatever, I, you know, I, I'd sort of know, but I wouldn't really give you an answer. And it's because 
the learning that you do in different sectors. So I was involved in more infrastructure related work, bigger schemes. That's just different to what another planner in this panel would might know about something else. And it's just understanding that just take the time to learn a little bit about everything and and, and sort of work your way, you work your way through. Um, but I know it's a tough time out there at the moment as well. You know, the economy is where it is, but there is a lot of roles still out there. But it's as Sarah sort of says, there's different bits that you can learn from different industries. Um, and when you want to come into planning as well, if that's not happening right now. Yeah, and I think the important message there then is that, you know, there's no, no such thing as a step backwards. It's just you're stepping forward and gain different skills no matter where you end up. Um, and so if if you've got 10 more minutes to sort of stay for the q and is that all right with everyone? Yeah, cool. So I'll hand over now to Charlotte and she'll pull some questions out of the chat. Um, and we'll do the Q&A. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for... Um answering Camille's questions there. Um, I'm going to address two questions first of all, um, combine them together. Um, we've had two questions regarding whether we need a master's to get into planning um, or if there are other ways that you can get into planning. I know that a couple of you don't necessarily um, start with a master's. So if anybody wants to um, jump in, maybe um, Jim or John, I think, um, with your backgrounds in geology, et cetera. Yeah, um, get the job and with the offers on job, job training, there's apprenticeship schemes, which Kat will tell you all about. Uh, two of mine are, are currently doing it, um, apprentice planners. Um, they will teach you how to do it. Uh, if you've got an interest in it, if, whatever your background, whether it be social science, which science. Got, whether it be a hard science, uh, history, you've got empathetic, em, yeah, scientific and empathic skills. The, the MSC will give you uh, the planning, the planner act spin, but um, yeah, nothing, you can take anything into it. A lot of lawyers come into it, or legal people, and go back into law. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll just quickly add to that. I mean, just take from the civil service point of view, you know, you don't need to be a planner to join the civil service unless it's a, a specific planner job. As I say, you don't need to be, you know, a lot of people within the planning directorate are not planners. And, you know, I know people, civil servants, uh, actually, most of them, I assume they're all planners. Most of them know more about planning than I do. And, you know, I've got 20 years experience. Um, but, but, you know, there, there are people within the civil service and planning director have done exactly that, where the civil service have basically funded for them to get a, a planning degree that will allow them to become chartered. So, so as I say, I think just get in there, start start learning on the job. You, you don't necessarily need that, 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 that qualification. But, um, you know, a lot, a lot of geographers I've seen, they'll do a master's conversion. But as I say, it's not necessary unless it's absolutely specified and there are other ways around. Uh, thank you. And Sarah, maybe um, you could provide some insight into how you found coming from the master's and how that's helped you in your career. Yeah, so from doing my master's, um, I was able part time, I was able to bring in a lot of what I learned from my master's into my job. Um, and just learning about different aspects, because I started my master's whilst I was working for um, Strategic Land Promoter, ma mainly housing. Um, so it was nice to do touch on different subjects um, during the master's. So I think that that's made me more of a rounded planner um, myself. But um, I do feel like working, doing it on the job is a big um big help because you can then take take your day life day day job and bring in your skills for your masters and link it together but uh, thank you and Varela, do you have anything to yeah. add just one point which is slightly different so um just to to direct people to the rtpi slightly as well there there is a, a big push at the rtpi to bring people from different professions into planning and there, I think there's a paper on the RTPI website about it and, and the, the chartered routes and the routes that people take to get their chartership has changed slightly. And it does take into consideration people coming from other elements and um, from other professions and moving into, into planning. So I think it's encouraged because it, it provides a variety of skills into the profession, which is different to, to what you might just learn in a planning master. So there is different routes. That's basically what I'm going to say, Charlotte, on that one. Fantastic, thank you. Um, next, another combination of two questions. Obviously, at the moment, it's really hard for students to get work experience. You can't do it in the office and, you know, shadow people. So what would you recommend to students to keep themselves relevant when they can't get work experience? Are there any resources that they can access or any um, extracurricular activities they could possibly do? 
don't know if anybody wants to start off. Yeah, I mean, I, I might just quickly start just just going from the RTPI sort of lead because I used to head up Planning Aid England. So you can volunteer as a planner through Planning Aid England, which actually will get you experience, uh, hopefully. And, you, you you know, you might be able to buddy up with 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 more um, um, uh, uh experienced planners to, to assist with that so I'd, I'd, I'd look into that in the first instance otherwise you know just just doing L&D reading up on on, on you know relevant uh, planning articles uh, you know planning reform at the moment have a read of the planning uh, white paper that should uh, 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 help you out for the new system that will um, that will be uh, 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 coming coming soon great thank you has anybody else got any top yeah. tips I, I, oh, sorry. Uh, I'll just say um, there's lots of because we're all stuck at home. There's a lot of chance to to do your uh, doing um, com, uh, going online. T, um, uh, my, my favourite uh, town and country planning association. Loads of stuff on there. Twenty minute neighbourhoods, all sorts of things. Post COVID, post Brexit. What's planning going to look like? It keeps you up to date. So, you know, so then you can go if you get a job into you, or then you or you're filling out your forms. Um, it's not necessarily you know experience, but you're you're well well aware. And just looking at the news, you know things like even films like Hot Fuzz was about planning decision. Um, so it's everywhere and everything you do, and just be aware that you know most thing most neighbours fall out over planning. Um, most most um, big infrastructure projects planning is blamed. It's not. It's the legal system, I think, or the misuse of the legal system. But just be aware. Yeah, you've got time to pause and, and make use of your time. RTPI, I've got loads of things. Uh, I think there's things on, on uh, Facebook. Um, uh, have I got planning news for you? Things like that from lawyers. Really listen to the lawyers. If they go up, if they're giving free advice, um, it's really good to see what they're up to. Um, they, they do free training courses or free courses and stuff, and you can sort of crash them for free. Fantastic, thank you. One more for me, Charlotte. Just keep keep badgering us. Uh, people might not people might not forgive me for this, but keep badgering us. If if there's opportunities that we you know there's an internship or something, you know there's a piece of work we might need help with, we will we will bring people in, um, and and I'm sure other organisations will. And don't be shy. I think the enthusiasm you show by actually emailing us and saying. Oh, I'm interested in doing an internship, or I want to, you know, come and wait for this organisation or that organisation. I think it shows when you come to interview or or whatever that you you want to be part of that organisation, but you want to learn. And there will be bits. I know it's been tough because as soon as COVID happened over the summer, you know, we were looking to bring in a couple of internships, and it, we just couldn't. It, they, the business just had to decide what to do with it. Um, but there will be opportunities. So just keep keep emailing people and keep trying and even going back to 2011 that's what I was doing 2010 is just making sure that people knew I was available for work. Great thank you yeah Sarah do you have anything to add? Just try and um, attend things like uh, planning committee I know it's sometimes very boring but you learn so much about politics and what what members are saying about different things so just attend a few just to get your head around the structure because it's it's a very important part of planning so i think just having a few of those and putting those on your cv that you you know the structure of planning committee i think that's a big thing I just, just want to dive in there. Yeah, the, the pl most planning committees now have gone online and I think you can go and attend. It is sometimes the best free entertainment you are likely to ever see if it's contentious. It's, and you'll understand everything that we've talked about all comes to a head. So, yeah, yeah, it doesn't sound riveting, but it can be. And, think, and sometimes it, just be lucky you're not the planning officer sat, sat there. <laughs> I think we've all seen that viral video of the parish council meeting. <laughs> And um, it's quite similar to what actual committees are like. Um, John has just added also to see what's going on locally. Um, there might be neighbourhood plans you can get involved with um, in your local area or anything to do with parish councils, etc. Um, and then I think we've answered all the other questions. But one last question from Emily here is what changes do you think we'll see in national planning policy in the coming years? And obviously the question on everyone's minds is are any of these due to COVID specifically? 
John, you might be best to start us off on this one. Oh, I am, but I'm obviously not going to answer. So, oh, John, uh, come we, on, John. Uh, I was looking forward to that. <laughs> we have a planning white paper with uh, 40,000 consultation responses that, that we are currently working our way through. But, um, but yeah, look, I mean, th there will be, we will say something in due course, uh, just, just to let the outside world know what we're going a response to the consultation but i'm i'm, I'm remiss to put uh, a timetabling on stuff but but look work is happening a lot of work within the department you know we're all geared up with what 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 is essentially the largest uh, reform to the planning system since its inception so you know that's that's no no easy feat so uh, uh and then trying to make sure that all the different aspects you know work together as you've seen here planning is very very complicated and diverse you know with um, we need to make sure we have a system that actually works and functions uh, in terms of COVID really interesting point I mean we don't really know yet I mean obviously I've talked about legislation I put through to to ease uh, uh, the planning system with COVID but actually you know maybe we should make these permanent yeah I mean are, are, are our regulations fit for purpose in the modern world we, we, we've talked about consul uh, committees being online you know more people are engaged so, so actually maybe uh, we do need to look at our system and how it works in light of maybe new ways of working in a different world that we're going to be living in the, the issue is we, we just don't know yet so look we might see more of a focus on economic development if we're going into uh recessions potentially there might be different roles for town centers uh depending on working patterns all of these things will come out and i, I think actually the other people on the panel are probably better than i to, to tell you because they're, they're obviously uh you know living it on on the ground but but one thing's for certain it's not going to be dull it's not going to be boring and um i think there's going to be uh, plenty of change and I, I think the majority for good if, if you follow um on the covid question i think there will be i think the the climate change emergency and covid are, are if you've if you witnessed my lecture to Birmingham students a few weeks ago, you, you hear me banging on about this, but the solutions to the climate change emergency are very similar to what's going to come out of COVID with green space, valuing um, that those social, the, the retail is changing, what will replace it, more, gr more greenery, more social interactions in town centres, um, offices, residential, what, you know, what will a town centre look like? And I think what I hope comes out of the white paper, and, and I'll bang on about this because I, I see myself as a regional planner, is something on um on that strategic landscape catchment that scale where for me environmental issues are best tackled at that higher level others would say housing transport um you need that higher level duty to cooperate there's a dissertation in there how effective it's been um but i'd like something uh, city, yeah, mayor city regions what's coming what's what's statutory what i'd like to see something of a statutory level come out at that sort of I'll say regional. It's a, it was a dirty word a few years ago, but <laughs> that um, that that city city region. I think you can say uh, something there. Otherwise, you're planning in isolation, local, and it's very hard for us at the at the agency to rivers do what they want. They cut through land uh, uh, out different authorities. Very hard to do flood risk. Very hard to do catchment. Very hard to deliver the 25 year environment plan for the governments if we are doing it piecemeal. It is possible. It's just much easier if there's a re if there's some sort of sub sub national level you can go in at to sort of set the tone. That's my soapbox moment over. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything to add before we wrap up? Good three points. Is all right. Just just very quickly reiterate Jim's point there. I think very very strongly about strategic planning and the reintroduce reintroduction of it because I think um since 2011 and the sort of changes and um, with the localism act this is the there's a disengagement between that level house um planning is not about housing not just housing all the time we hear 300,000 homes we got to deliver this it's about strategic planning create places with infrastructure and housing together i strongly feel very similar to jim there that this this regional element or whatever whatever it's going to create needs to come back into play the second point is around is a similar point but it's about the consenting tools to do that so i i said you know there's a lot of work going on with garden towns and i strongly again believe that the development consent or the process the planning act 2008 needs to have a stronger 
um, input to actually deliver garden towns as we go forward. These are massive schemes. They transcend um, 15-year local plans. They go up to 30, 40 years. There's a real need to understand that if we're going to deliver them, we actually need to deliver them in a different way to the local plan system. And the third point is more of a, a, a point for the students generally. There is a big shift in the planning um, system coming. So when I became a planner in 2011, 2011, we had the change with the Localism Act 2010. And one of our lecturers said to us, the next five years, do not worry, because there will be a lot of work for all planners to take place. And I think, I just want to finish on that. I think there's a real whatever shift happens, whatever John and, and the team get on with, I think there's going to be something really interesting and there'll be something that actually creates more jobs in the future for, for a lot of town planners. Um, and we need we need more students and we need more planners because we're all drowned. So come and join us. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Anything else from anybody? Well, that's great. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, um, John, Jim, Vera and Sarah. Um, we've had such a great breadth of knowledge from you all. And I know that definitely, especially for the younger years who are just getting dipping their toes into the planning world, it's been really, really useful. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us all. And um, hopefully we'll see you at our um, events in the future soon.